someone to take pictures. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Good evening and uh, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand. I'm uh, Marwan Markenmarker, correspondent for the Interpress Service News Agency and a former FCCT president. It is nice to see a full house here for an event, panel discussion that no doubt uh, is on a theme that journalists covering Southeast Asia have been focused on. But in addition to uh, welcoming the audience here, we have another audience to welcome because uh, the, the FCCT is embarking on something new tonight. Uh, tonight's event is going as, as a live webcast to people in Myanmar, if they are interested, and other parts of Thailand. Uh, the FCCT's bulletin actually has the coordinates. Uh, so if you want to tweet and inform your friends you have the uh, details there. Uh, b before I introduce the panel, a couple of FCCT events that are coming up. Uh, there's a press conference for journalists here next Tuesday on the problem with thalassemia. Uh, that's May 14th. On May 15th, the Palestinian Solidarity Committee is having a film uh, to mark the Palestinian Nakba. And uh, on May 16th, we have a panel discussion on problems unfolding in Thailand South and on May 17th uh, an, an event to a tribute to Fabio Polenghi, an Italian journalist who was killed while covering the political upheavals that unfolded on the streets of Bangkok in May 2010. Normally FCCT panels follow a format where most of you are familiar with where a moderator sits, stands here and we have speakers there each delivering 10 minute presentations and we open the session for the question and answer session but we're having it slightly different uh, it's sort of almost like uh, a discussion you see on television we have Veronica Pedroza a well-known independent journalist broadcaster who works for Al Jazeera she's going to moderate this evening's panel uh, the three speakers for this evening, we are happy to welcome Ajahn Sulak Sivaraksa, a longtime friend of the club who always comes to us, speaks to us when there are sensitive issues and one of them often is on Les Majest. But today we are going to hear his take on Buddhism. We are also happy to welcome back to the club Dr. Mong Zani, uh, an outspoken Burmese critic, a blogger, uh, an academic at the London School of Economics. And finally, we also would like to welcome Mio Win, director of the Smile Education Organization in Myanmar. And we really appreciate the fact that he's come here as a member of uh, Burma's Muslim community and uh, at some risk. So it, there might be times when Mio Win might not want to take all the questions directed to him, given that he's got to go back to the country. Uh, so please respect his decision for silence, if that is the case. Uh, the format is, the, the panel begins and then we open the floor for question and answer sessions and Veronica will be very strict. We appreciate questions and not long speeches from people who will take to the mic uh, once the Q&A session uh, begins. So, Veronica, over to you. Thanks, Thanks very much indeed, Marwan. 
Uh, and thank you indeed to the panel. I thought I was introducing them, so I've got a few words um, for, uh, to introduce them with as well, if you don't mind. But before we begin, I just wanted to say um, how much what's been happening in Burma against the Muslims has broken my heart and the hearts of so many people that I know. Um, it's just a desperate, desperate situation. I try and make it real to people back in Doha, for example. They kind of understand it because of the Muslim thing. But at the same time, um, it's not like Syria, where you have you know, hundreds of thousands of refugees able to go across the border to Jordan or Lebanon. Um, there is nowhere for the Rohingya to go. There is nowhere for them to go. It is just the most heartbreaking thing that I have, I have had the misfortune to see happen in my lifetime, I feel. Um, it is, the, the topic that we're going to undertake today is uh, very controversial. People are dying because of it. Um, tempers get very heated. If I can ask, when we speak today, please think about what you're saying. Please think about what you're asking and the implications. There's a, very, there's a quite a witty quote that I came across the other day. I, I can't even remember who said it, but it was something like, many people would really die before they think. In fact, they do. Please think before you die, if I may put it that way, if I may turn it around that way. Um, as Marwan mentioned, Mirwin has come at some personal risk. We did invite several other Muslim leaders and other religious leaders to come from uh, Burma, Myanmar, and they decided against it. Um, so I really am so grateful that you've come to give your perspective today. And... Uh, I really hope that you don't get into too much trouble when you get back. <laughs> and then uh, Ajahn Sulak, a Siamese intellectual, has started so many amazing social, spiritual, humanitarian, ecological movements for this country and has got into trouble as well for it. Controversial too, if I may describe you as such. Um, and Zani, uh, an old friend, and uh, who has been the first intellectual, he calls this a genocide, what's happening in Burma today. Uh, he is a visiting fellow with the LSE, as um, Marwan said. Uh, he's also got a book coming out next year, oh, no. if, I can finish. If, he, if he ever finishes it. <laughs> but I was just going to give him a plug there. If you want to know more about Ajahn, uh, Ajahn Sulak's uh, life as well, I was going to say, I forgot to mention, you can find out through his publication, Seeds of Peace, which he's generously given me a copy of. But if anyone else is interested to find out more about it, about him, here it is. So let it's us... On sale, out there. It's on sale, apparently. Baht. It's only 100 baht. Um, so should we start? Um, Mil Win, I thought we would start with you because you've, start, you've come from such a long way. I know that you prepared something, but I wondered if I could ask you to speak naturally from the heart as far as you feel comfortable and tell us about the experience that you've had uh, under the current Myanmar government as a Muslim, as a Muslim leader, educating uh, across cultures, across religions, and across ethnicities in Rangoon. Thank you very much. Um, currently, under the current Myanmar government, there has been widespread and unprecedented level of the hate and hostility directed against Muslim Obama. There has been wide distribution of hateful propaganda in the form of pamphlets and videos and the ongoing organization of public sermons of men's and even with religious and community leaders spreading message of intolerance and hate. Also, the level of attack against Burmese Muslims, men, women, and children, such as verbal abuse, physically, criminal act of arson and robbery, 
and render an error of the destruction of life and property and reach the higher historical peak and the current administration. This is very significant. This is not communal, my thought that this is not communal or sectarian conflict between Buddhist majority and Muslim minority in Burma. It is a series of one-sided, targeted violence and often deadly attack against their properties and businesses which occur under the purview of state authority. The facts that the government has ignored these repeated act of hate and violence targeting the religion of Islam and Muslim in Myanmar has resulted in the loss of national identity and honor among the international community. Let me ask you about whether this is a new phen phenomenon. You say it's very significant, it's ha happened under this government, but isn't the, it the case that there are historical, there's historical precedents? Um, yeah. For a long time, there have been systematically and methodical targeting and victimization of the Burmese Muslim, residing in the loss of life and livelihood to the point of total despair and the loss of hope for those who are at the receiving end. Although the majority of Burmese Muslims have been living in a state of great mental struggle on a daily basis due to the lack of security and dignity. There has not been enough support or sympathy from major national, political, religious and humanitarian leaders, so-called. Individual, the member of parliament, therefore, the state of helplessness and pain for Burmese Muslim have, has, has de depended and still continue. We know the war in differences with heartbroken, very sorrow. So do we? Yeah. But yeah. Why, why does it matter, in your view, to the country? Yeah. I thought that the welfare of the Burmese Muslims is the welfare of the nation. Because of we are citizens, we were born here. We thought that Myanmar is our country. The security of Burmese Muslim is the security of the nation. That all Muslims feeling like that. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the government to provide safety and the security to our Muslims under the international law, engaging in the organized fighting and violence in multiple location in a crime against humanity if based on ethnic city or religions. That's my point. Um, so do you think that there is uh, there are consequences for other minorities in Burma? Yeah. Yes, that's really very challenging time. There are, I have uh, some serious question about the uh, current situation. For, so there we're happening different violence and attack. So up to now, there's nobody responsible to clear who are those. There is not arrested at all for this attacker. So why have 969 not been identified? That's a key question. The second thing is, why have their members not been arrested? Why have they been allowed to continue with their campaign to disseminate misinformation about the Muslim and Islam among the Buddhist majority? That's a current, you know, uh, serious question, those issues. I'm going to um, pause at this point, and before we move on to Ajahn Sulak, I just wanted to show some 
photographs. If I can ask Kun Pond, where are you, to help out with this. Do you know how to work that? Not, yeah? Are we able to show the slides, the, the, the photographs? I just wanted to show you some photographs that were taken in Mulmain and Rangoon just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, two or three weeks ago. Um, to illustrate what's going on in the country. Okay, taken by Vincenzo Floramo. These are refugees from Minla Township in Bagor. They're sheltering in a mosque in Rangoon. So they've traveled something like 200 miles to find safety. Oi, this is not the right one. This is the wrong picture. Yes. <laughs> Stop from the beginning. If I may. Play again. Play again. Thank you. Okay, so play. Ah, uh, I see. So that's the picture that I was referring to. Um, I can't, we can't name the mosque because it will get them into trouble and perhaps incur more violence if people know that they are sheltering refugees there. Can you go on the next one? You can play, actually. Okay, the next slide picture is... That's it. U Pum Nawanta, member of the Peace Cultivation Network into Interreligious Dialogue. He, he believes that cronies in the military are behind the violence, and he is a rare monk who supports Myanmar citizenship for Rohingya. In the main Muslim quarter in Rangoon or Yangon, they've set up barricades every night. They have citizen patrols to protect themselves against possible attack. They receive threats every night by people riding in cars, roaming around their uh, neighborhoods, shouting, uh, shouting insults, racial insults to people and calling for their deaths. Every street has a barricade since the events in Meitila and Bagol. Uh, this is uh, the scene in a Buddhist household uh, where, in Mektila, where they're watching a video of U Wiratu, I'm sure many of you recognize, uh, as he gives one of his uh, hate speeches against Muslims. You might recognize Ashin uh, Gambira, U Gambira. Uh, he actually lives not far from Megtila. And he, when he was interviewed, he said, uh, you might, rem uh, in case you don't know, U Gambira was an uh, activist monk during the so-called Saffron Revolution in 2007. Anyway, he says that he thinks that Wiratu is just a puppet who wants fame and wants uh, other bigger, and is a puppet of other bigger unnamed powers. Mektila, the Muslim quarter, Tiri Mingalar, totally destroyed, devastated. There are uh, a number of extremely well-researched uh, accounts of what happened during that time. My favorite is by Reuters. Uh, this is uh, Uwiratu's monastery, and these are allegedly Rakhine victims of violence. But actually, some of the pictures it's been found have come from southern Thailand. And I don't know if you can see behind the front poster, there's a couple of words behind. Do you see that? It says virus 2. You see, it's that, front, that poster on the front covers up the words Islam virus 2.
this is the same place, and again, more uh, pictures, propaganda type pictures uh, to support Uweratu's cause. Again, Uweratu. Apparently, out the back, he's got lots of pictures of himself as well, big pictures of himself. Pictures of Aung San, of Aung San Suu Kyi with Hillary Clinton when she was visiting. Ah, this, this is, these are the stickers of the 969 campaign in Rangoon. Uh, and they were being sold in front of Bojose Aung San Market, uh, Scots Market. If someone from another religion uses these stickers, then uh, other Buddhists are instructed that they can take them to court. So if you're Christian and you stick these stickers up, you could be taken to court by Buddhists. Next one. This is the market in, in Mulmain. The stalls take it upon themselves to uh, identify themselves with these stickers. It's not... It's, I don't think it's really clear whether the stall holders are actually saying that they sympathize with the cause, but I think many of them are just given the stickers and put them up. Because a monk has given them to them. Like this is a you know, fairly typical shrine and above the 969 sticker. Ah, um, this is the monastery where the 969 Secretariat is based. The words say, if it is necessary, we will use our bones to set up a fence. These are the stickers all Buddhists should use. Okay. It's inside the monastery. Ah, this is the uh, monk who designed the logo, the 969 logo. Uh, he launched it on the 30th of October 2012. You, you may remember that this was when a second wave of apparently coordinated violence happened in Burma, Myanmar. Um, he feels that it's necessary, he said, to remind people of their Buddhist values. If not, Buddhism would be lost in Burma, as it was lost in Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Indonesia. He thinks there is an invasion, and he claims that 969 had nothing to do with the October violence. This is an ordinary cafe in Rangoon, and you can see the 969 sticker there as well. A ceremony at the end of Tingyan. And finally, a picture from one of the main mosques uh, in Rangoon, Yangon. Um, I can't identify which mosque it is because I've been told that the people who run it are worried that if it's found out that they have been talking to journalists or letting journalists come and take pictures, they could get into trouble. Okay. Thank you very much, just to help set the tone for the evening. During the Saffron Revolution at Jan Sulak, we heard a very lovely um, mantra being chanted in Burma. Um, Let everyone be free from harm. Let everyone be free from anger. Let everyone be free from hardship. And yet, they seem to be the same monks who were conducting what Human Rights Watch in a report just the other week called ethnic cleansing. How's this happened? First of all, you have to understand that the teaching of the Buddha is to help people to transform violence into loving kindness to transform greed into generosity, to transform delusion 
into proper understanding that the heart core of the teaching of the Buddha and if you practice the heart core teaching of the Buddha you cannot harm anybody first of all you must learn not to harm yourself that idealism in the teaching of the Buddha but sometimes this idealism doesn't work why doesn't why does it work? Because deep down in each human being we have fear and the ultimate in the teaching of Buddha is how to overcome fear in Pali and Sanskrit called Apaya no fear that's the same word as forgiveness once you have fear, you can be violent, you can be greedy, you can be deluded. Unfortunately, not only in Burma, in this country, Sri Lanka, where Buddhism prevails, when people are afraid, they harm others, not themselves. But if they practice the teaching of the Buddha, even they have fear, aggression from others. If the worst comes to the worst, they rather harm themselves than others. That's why the suffering revolution. The monk came out again the tyrannical dictatorship they are willing to lose their life their liberty they have been treated very badly but they stick to non-violence I think people must not forget that great achievement of the Buddhists in Burma I think partly Burma has changed due to not solely but partly to the Seven Revolution. Tibet in a much worse situation. Fifty years after the Chinese occupation and the Chinese treated the Tibetan much worse than what happened in Burma. And yet the Tibetans under the leadership of His Holiness we must not hate the Chinese. We must learn to love them. Because if you hate other people, hatred is in you. You become dull, you become violent. A decent human being must learn not to be violent, to be a decent person. Of course, after 50 years now of Chinese occupation, but I still feel that the Tibetan one of these days will win the day. Because the world, all over the world, violence prevails everywhere. But I'm sure non-violence will take place. So Burma right now is a sad issue. The Burmese monks could not overcome fear through meditation, through wisdom, through rightful way of thinking. So they do the wrong thing. And not only Burma now. You go right back to Theravada Buddhism, go right back to Sri Lanka. In the time, thousand years ago, when the Sinhalese were fighting the Tamils, and the Sinhalese killed so many Tamils, and the monk told the Sinhalese that you only kill half human being because the Tamils were not Buddhists. This is distortion of Buddhism. In this country, the good thing is that the monks are not that strong politically. The monks here are only strong commercially. They only make money. <laughs> it's bad enough. But the government 
here, worse than the monks. In the name of Buddhism, in the name of Thai nationality, when they kill the Muslim in the south, they promote Thaiism because the Malay were Muslim, kill them. My friend Thaksin Chinawat did that. Poor chap, he couldn't come back yet. <laughs> and he come back, he will do the worse than that. So I think one has to be realistic. But in the teaching of the Buddha, the best thing to do is to learn to stand from fear in yourself. Stand from fear to be to have moral courage. And once you do that, you recognize our Muslim brother and sister. They are no different from us. They are Malay, whether they are Rohingya. But this issue is not easily resolved at the Foreign Conference Club. The issue of Buddhist Muslim have to be taken seriously. Since I'm one of the founder of the International Network in Cage Buddhist, we propose to have a Buddhist Muslim dialogue in Kuala Lumpur. Now, if you are interested, I can give you by at the end of this year, October, November, we have a meeting. It had to be taken seriously by both parties. The Buddhists must learn to respect the Muslim as our brother and sister. We must learn that our friend religion is not superior or inferior to our religion. This I learned from my teacher, Ajahn Puttathasa. He said, you want to be a Buddhist? Stick to the base of Buddhism. There's a lot of dreadful things in Buddhism also. A lot of garbage in Buddhism. And if you're not careful, a lot of naturalism in Buddhism. You must get away naturalism. You must get away of selfishness. And you must learn that other religions, not the same as your religion, but not worse than your religion. With that understanding, we will resolve things deeply, constructively. I think the Buddhist Muslim issue must be resolved seriously with much compassion, with much understanding. Because you think it might get worse? I don't want to make any brief statement. Everything could be better, could be worse. But at the same time, I must say, I have great respect for my Burmese friends. Now, the first time that they have freedom of expression, freedom of expression could be very positive. It could also be very negative. Particularly Burma is now opening up to capitalism, consumerism. They're jumping from the Chinese hegemony under American hegemony could be much worse. With my respect to my Burmese friends, you open your country, but you must realize that in Burma, you change the name to Myanmar now. You realize that the word Myanmar also look down upon other ethnic groups. And the Burmese deep down feel insecure because there are so many ethnic groups, perhaps more than the Burmese themselves. You must overcome this insecurity and regard all the ethnic Burmese, ethnic non-Burmans as your friends, as your brothers and sisters, whether they are Muslim or Christian. We have not tackled the issue of the Christian yet. The Christian in Kachin land have been maltreated, not better than the Muslim, but not yet in the forefront, not yet to the attention of the Foreign Conservation Club. 
I think we have to dig deep into human suffering. The Buddha this call it dukkha. Dukkha is not only personal, social, environmental. If we take the dukkha seriously, the Muslim and the Buddhist, the Christian, we must learn together. With atheist, agnostic, tackle dukkha. And dukkha now, not only personal, but the whole structure of violence. If you tackle the structure of violence, put in the Christian term, you hate sin and not a sinner. And then in that sense, we shall become more non-violent. We shall have more wisdom and compassion. Thank you. Ajahn, I just want to ask you as well. Your vision of engaged Buddhism, of multiculturalism across Southeast Asia, is at odds with the political leader's vision for the region in the sense that there's a very pronounced philosophy of so-called non-interference. ASEAN has been very quiet. You know, neighboring countries are quiet about what's going on in Burma against the Muslims. How, how do you work through that? To be quiet and to sit on the fence that is not Buddhist, nor Islam, nor Christian. From the Buddhist point of view, you must acknowledge Dukkha. The Muslim suffering is our own suffering. In which way we can come together in, or, in order to resolve this Dukkha individually, socially, environmentally. Not to say that I am not aware of it. I could not care less about it. I think that the wrong interpretation of the teaching of the Buddha. Indeed, I talked to the North leader in the suffering revolution. They talked to me some years ago. Achan, we Buddhists suffer from our bad karma. That's why we deserve dictatorship. I said that wrong interpretation. Bad karma may be there, but the teaching of the Buddha is how to confront right now, how to reconstruct our consciousness in order to change our way of thinking, way of speaking, way of action, to change our habit with good friends. We can do things appropriately. Are you saying, Ajahn, that Buddhism and nationalism are at odds with each other, that it's a kind of oxymoron? Nationalism is an extension of selfishness. The Buddha teaches against selfishness. Nationalism is a, a big issue of selfishness. Nationalism is not to be condemned, to be understood, and to take it lightly. People don't realize that you are here. Do you realize that? We still salute the flag 8 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the evening. If you listen to the national anthem, the Thai Lord of Nurture, this great Thailand, only one Thai race so superior, it sounds like Hitler, silent Nazism, and yet people don't care. That's the dilemma of this country. Nationalism, I think to quote Dr. Johnson, is the Razi fuse of the scoundrel. The last refuge of the scoundrel. Thank you. Uh, Ajahn will come back to you, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for you, but I, I do want to give um, Dr. Zani a chance to step in here, because we've introduced this theme. Of we've been talking about the actual experience of Muslims in Burma, Myanmar. We've talked about Buddhist philosophy and how it has kind of been perverted, I suppose, or subverted uh, in this uh, anti-Muslim violence. Um, and there is a political edge to it as well that I know you want to discuss. Um, can you elaborate? Yeah. Um, you know, people think it's, um, it's, politics is about ideas and, you know, reason, rationality. But there's always um, 
um, you know, cultural and personal dimensions to it. Let me just start with um, the personal. What is happening in Burma, or what has been happening in Burma over the past two years, or almost two years, is categorically against everything I was taught how to be a good human. You know, everything I was taught by my parents, everything I was taught by my uh, community of monks, teachers, yeah? um, as a Buddhist, and everything that I stand for as an activist who take human rights seriously and who attempt to live, not always with you know, full success, but attempt to live what I claim to be my values, which is treating human beings with decency and respect. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, human rights activists who call themselves uh, human rights activists in my country. We have millions of Buddhists who call themselves Buddhists. But none of what they say, what they think, or what they appear to think, and what they are engaged in, whether directly supporting or participating in the pogroms against the uh, Muslims and the Rohingyas, or um, you know, cheering on in social media, as well as in conversations face-to-face -face in Rangoon, Mandalay, other places. I have an um, almost three, uh, four years old daughter, and I also have an older daughter um, who lives uh, in California. Each time I see you know, either daughters, each time I hold my uh, younger daughter, I feel the pain as a parent. I think many of you are parents and grandparents. I feel the pain not because I hold my daughters, but because I cannot help but think that um, you know, there are Muslim parents and Rohingya parents, or whom we call them Bengali. You know, Bengalis are very accomplished people. You know, start with Rabindranath Tagore, um, Mohammed Yunus, um, Grameen Bank pers uh, founder, and above all, Amartya Sen, one of the greatest living intellectuals, not just Asians, you know, uh, of all cultures. I feel the pain because I can't help but think that a lot of them don't have children anymore to hold because of the Burmese, the Rakhines, self-identified Buddhists and what we as a society is doing. And there is a problem with seeing Burmese and Buddhist society as, you know, categorically a peaceful society. In general, in the Western eyes, in the Western Orientalist eyes, Buddhists are peaceful. But in reality, Buddhists are as evil, and forgive me for the religious word, as evil, as violent, as vile and, you know, like depraved as anyone on this earth. So violence is not exclusive property of non-Buddhist. And if you look at, you know, throughout history, you know, like if you look at like a, a samurais, if you look at like um, Buddhist monks in China, 500, 600, 1,000 years ago, they were as violent and genocidal as the Burmese today. And so I think the issue that we are facing today is not just about Burmese society, Buddhists going bad or, you know, the state tacitly supporting the bad Buddhists and their programs. It is actually the active unfolding process of collaborating, collaboration between the Sangha, the Buddhist monks, the order, the society, and uh, the state, of course. If you so basically what we are seeing today in Burma is nothing short of a genocide. You know. And, you know, like legal minds can split hair and, you know, people can debate over, over this issue for hours. What actually, I mean, I find most outrageous and I find it 
like you know, in a most visceral sense, is that the Burmese society, including pol politicians, human rights leaders, human rights educators, are objecting not to the very act of ethnic cleansing, the, the term that was used rather judiciously and conservatively by the Human Rights Watch when it released its report on March the 22nd. The Burmese are outraged that the Human Rights Watch will call what is happening in Burma by its own name, ethnic cleansing. But they are not outraged that the act of ethnic cleansing is being done in the name of religion, in the name of national security. That includes people from, you know, most famed dissidents. Some are vocally, actively opposed to the characterization of what's happening as ethnic cleansing, and others are opposed to it by their own, you know, willful and thunderous silence in the case of Aung San Suu Kyi. So I think uh, Veronica wants me to stop here. <laughs> To what extent is the state involved in the situation uh, surrounding the Muslims in the country? Well, two issues. One is the state's verifiable attempts to mobilize, you know, in quote, historical, basically anti-Muslim and anti people of Indian subcontinent, brown people, darker-skinned people, racism that pervades in our society, in times when it needs issues for political and strategic mobilization of the society. And the other issue is the issue of Rohingya. Well, you know, the state in Burma and the society in Burma are engaged in the crimes against humanity. And what I'm doing tonight is you know, committing a crime against the state, the state that is neo-fascist, that refuses to call the, the ethnic people the Rohingya in Western Burma by their own self-chosen name. I think the issue of Rohingya is actually a long-running issue. What we are seeing is a process that has been going on over the past 40 years, the violence, mass violence against the Rohingyas in Western Burma did not take place just a few, day, a few years ago or last year. It has been going on since, say, 1965, when their ethnic identity was quietly butchered. And I, you know, I put together a few slides to show that these people... They were not just like, you know, boat people, mujahideens trying to claim the country and, you know, a, a slice of Rakhine or Western Burma and uh, claim independence the way Kosovo and other areas have done it. Which is the narrative that yeah, is being that, put forward. Yeah, that is the narrative. But I think like here, the, the, you know, I, I'll, if I have time or like in the q and I'll talk about the anti-Muslim um, um, racism and the state's involvement. But I think the issue of Rohingya is critically important. It is a litmus test for a people that wants to call themselves Buddhist. <laughs> because, you know, the, the genocide of the Rohingya is everything that, um, that is against what Buddhism is all about. You know, it's, and it's, it's, the genocide here involves a butcher of the truth. The truth that these people existed officially. These people were recognized from 1954 onward as an official constitutive ethnic group of Burma. And they had their own radio program you know, on a, a Burmese broadcasting service, BBS. And they had prominent figures serving in different places. And they were not, they, were con they are being constructed by the ultra-nationalist Rakhines, whom I call like a neo-fascist, um, who are sitting in today's parliament in Nepi Do as Muj you know, descendants of Mujahideens. There were you know, thousands of documents in the National Archives, if people have access to, that indicate that 
these people that we are deriding or that whose existence we are denying today, we're fighting with the armed forces of Burma against Mujahideens. They were not descendants of Mujahideens. Yeah. And so, um, I if if, if yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, you've got if, you've got some slides that you want to show. Yeah. I don't. I, mean, I think we might need Kun Pond again. <laughs> the IT so. department. Six slides, okay. said Zani. Six yeah, slides. Six. I'll be quick. Yeah? <laughs> um, there, there are two issues. One is the issue of ethnocide. That is, the attempt, official attempt by the state to erase an eth entire ethnic group that they existed. And they were recognized not just as citizens, but as an, a constitutive ethnic group of Burma. You know, when they arrived to Burma, how long they have been there, you know, that's totally different. You know, and, and uh, but the fact that they were recognized officially is the most important. Whether they arrived in the 17th century or 10th century or only in 1942, that's totally irrelevant. Many ethnic groups were basically the outcome of a process that anthropologists and sociologists call, you know, uh, imagination. Invention, manufacture, ethnic labels are no different from the shirts that we wear. The labels, are, Levi's is no different from, you know, Sp uh, um, Spanish. <laughs> they put it that way. It's just a longer process, much more elaborate process. Uh, yeah. And let me. This this is um, uh, the, the cover of Aung San's collector speeches. Like my mother's book I carry around. Um, a, a little gem. So in November 1945, on the 18th, he gave a speech in which he identified some of the major obstacles that independence movement for Burma was going to encounter. One was, well, one of the um, things that uh, he mentioned as a major stumbling block is the unscrupulous, unscrupulous elements whipping up ethnic hatred among people who would otherwise be united. Yeah? And this was the speech that he made when Aung San Suu Kyi was <laughs> barely six months. She was born like June 19, uh, 1945. And now like she's 67 and we have elements that are still whipping up ethnic hatred. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, this is the um, official encyclopedia, Union of Burma. This was printed in the Union of Gama Government Printing House in 1964, two years after Nguyen's army rule came into existence. And like the Burmese won't know, like, the two districts, the two northernmost districts of Western Burma, were, you know, Mondo and Budi Down, and 75% of the population there were engaged in farming and fishery. And they were officially named in 1964 as Rohingya people. And their religion was Muslim. And then this was uh, in 1954, 10 years before that uh, encyclopedia was printed, September 25th. Unu gave a speech on the uh, uh, potential for religious tensions. And he Call the Rohingyas by their name, Rohingya people. This is the official transcript. Um, and the, one of the arguments that both Rakhine, Rakhine nationalist leaders in the parliament as well as in society and Rakhine communities across Burma, and the, uh, the Burmese official state are uh, talking about is that you know, political opportunism, political expediency was what got people like, uh, you know, UNU and political parties to recognize Rohingya as an ethnic group, yeah, because they wanted Rohingya vote. Well, this was published by the Ministry of Defense in 1960, and this was Nguyen's second in command, Brigadier Aungji. Some of you met or knew him when he was alive, 15 November 1960. He 
gave a speech along with like you know three or four uh, vice um, chiefs of the army, where every single top-ranking official in the Burmese armed forces, not political party, yeah? but this was uh, uh, in 1960. They already took um, the uh, power as caretaker government. Every single top brass, top general, recognized Rohingya as Rohingya. And this, uh, finally, uh, um, this, is, this is from the, um, again, the um, Government Printing Translation Association. This is the 30th anniversary issue of the founding of the Burmese Broadcasting Service. And I, this is an important issue. It basically says, in the new broadcasting service, uh, it, since 1961, May 15th, national languages such as Mon, Pao, Lahu, and Rohingya were given 10 minutes programs each. That's how it started. And this is the man, the Rohingya program director, Ubat Ton, with his degrees, you know, reading news. And this is the official program printed in that government issued book. And finally, this is the face, the recurring face of fascism. Imam, you know, veterinary scientist or vet, uh, vet doctor by training and head of the Rakhine National Party, sitting in Nepido, and he is also implicated in the programs. Um, basically saying, well, these Rohingya people, he said, like, well, no, no, Bengali. These Bengali people, the problem is they call themselves Rohingya, but they are descendants of the Mujahideens who wanted to secede from the Union and fought against the Union. So we must never recognize them. And we will take, we need to take inspiration from Israel of all places to solve this problem. And then he, he, you know, there are Indian diplomats in this room. He, he pointed out, he said, uh, well, you know, if you cross the border in India, India just, you know, execute people summarily, whoever crosses the border. So that's the kind of thing that they are, um, he and his comrades in the uh, Rakhine fascist movement are advocating. Yeah. And then, so I think that like, we have a se very, very serious problem. And I think the world is just uh, waking up to, uh, to this issue. If you finally, if you read the, um, you know, forget the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for a moment. If you read the 1949 UN Convention, Uh, against um, genocide, you know, uh, prevention and punishment of genocide. The, it clearly spells out conditions under which a particular mass violence must be considered genocide. And out of five conditions, four conditions are in place in Burma. And uh, one of my, uh, you know, close um, uh, colleagues, uh, Sila, just uh, published a piece, I think yesterday, called Growing Signs of Genocide in Burma. And we are approaching that. Maybe full-scale genocide in the form of like, you know, in, in the style of Rwanda or like, you know, Pol Pot may not materialize. But, you know, um, within like a few months, the Burmese and the Rakhines have been able to displace permanently thousands of people and unknown number of people have been executed as Human Rights Watch report shows. And finally, you know, calling the killing against the Muslim or the targeted violence against Rohingya as sectarian is completely false because if you look at the, the, uh, the magnitude of violence, death and destruction that the Rohingya and the Muslims um, suffer, you know, is extremely highly disproportionate. More than 98% of violence and death and destruction is, was born by these communities. And so there is, if the, the Rakhines 
you know, like if you look at the, the number of like people displaced, the number of houses, and say just you know the second wave of violence in October, for the, the three thousand plus Rohingyas home, homes were destroyed, and only forty Rakhine homes were destroyed. And if you look at the number of people who were punished, you know, and more than one thousand six hundred officially, yeah. Uh, Rohingyas were arrested, and uh, only a hundred plus Rakhines were arrested for violence. But you know, to displace over one hundred and twenty thousand people from their homes in twelve different towns and cities, with the manpower of only a hundred and twenty plus, I don't think even Navy SEALs could accomplish that job. Then the question is. Who is who was aiding and abetting that 120 people? Um, uh, the president Tain Sein came out with a speech on Monday night, saying that he was committed to protecting minorities in the country. Um, well, I mean, Tain Sein is um, world-class liar. Yeah, I mean, like you think about it, you know, the guy was shortlisted for Nobel Peace Prize. Thank God, like, he narrowly missed it. Um, you know, like the amount of damage that that would have done to the reputation of the prize. And why? ICG has given him the man of the world peace on, you know... The, but, the, but why would he bother coming out with a speech like that? Well, I think he has excellent, um, you know, speech writers. The only thing that has changed since they, you know, like uh, they transformed themselves into quasi-civilian government in Burma in, in, um, in two, 20, um, 2011, actually, mm. in, in April or March, when the parliament was convened, mm. was really the, 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 the discourse. You know, uh, the, the speeches are getting much more liberal sounding. It, they, pleases, they please the ears of Western investors and Western governments that need some kind of internal moral justification to go and hold the uh, genocidal general's hand. Well, the, that the, is the only... Much has also thing. been made about the, the separation between the presidency and the military. No. You know what? You, we cannot talk about the genocide of the Rohingyas in Rakhine State without talking about this interagency you know, um, organization called NASAKA, or Border Affairs Council. That was founded in 1992 by Kenyon, head of uh, intelligence. And this interagency organization or agency um, has four different ministries with cabinet level representations in Thane Saint's government. Home affairs, that's, you know, the home affairs delivers you to torture chambers. And then immigration, they are not very nice. Um, then you've got, you know, uh, customs uh, ministries and then religious affairs. What does border control has to do with religious affairs? You know, like uh, the the uh, so these this Nasaka does not take orders from anyone except from Nepi Dog. Yeah. Now we have a new administration in Rakhine with the Rakhine figurehead. He cannot tell the police or Nasaka or anybody to do anything. To either go and attack the Rohingyas or to protect them, he, neither one he can do. And so the question is, you know, this unit, this agency, that only answers to and takes orders from Napi Dal, why did they not lift a finger? The Burmese Armed Forces, second largest in Southeast Asia, is known not for restraint, but for their trigger happiness over the past 50 years. And Thain Sein, of all the people, chairs this thing called National Defense and Security Council in Burmese, Ka Long. Ka Gwaiina Long Chong Ye. Thain Sein chairs this, you know, um, you know uh, super cabinet level council. And then so, there are two ways, to, two types of orders that a man, you know, at the helm could have issued. One was to stop the programs. Another one was to do nothing. Yeah? That to do nothing is equally effective as uh, ordering the troops to go and shoot. 
There have been a number of investigations that we've seen come out over the last three, uh, three weeks, three weeks. The Human Rights Watch report, the uh, Rakhine investigation uh, right. came out as well. Yeah. And I think that the Ro Rohingya themselves, right, have come out with their own report. No. Yeah, the, the, uh, let me see. The, um, yeah. the, the, I'm gonna, uh, the Rakhine Sectarian Violence Inquiry Report yeah. was put out exactly one week after Human Rights Watch came out with its report on 22nd. So it was issued on the 29th. And in the, this is the entire report in Burmese, and I, I don't think it's available in English. I'm not sure. But it was classified as secret. Yeah? Out of the 27 members on this commission, 11 are either my really all good friends or former friends or my good you know, acquaintances. And there are like you know, four or five like, you know, highly trained historians and social scientists and they are engaged, or they engaged in the ethnocide of the Rohingya, yeah. And then they, they would say the methodology section, you know, the findings, the sources, um, you know, um, cited or looked at. The National so you, archives. So, sorry, you're saying that they engaged in the ethnocide because they wrote this report. They were involved they, in writing. Not, not that, not simply that they wrote this report. They reinforced the state's deliberately falsified um, view that pervades the entire Burmese society that the Rohingya never existed as an ethnic group. Knowingly, they did that. Okay, sorry. I wanted to ask, see, I mean, I know that it's difficult to speak about these things, but I wonder if you had any comments of what Zani has been talking about yeah, even though the president said the, he has a responsibility to take the minority, to take care of minority, but the minority people, the fear, bigger and bigger day by day. That's a real situation inside Burma. So I can point out that issue. I've also pointed out the, relating with the Rakhine um, investigation report, but the he didn't mention about the Tango massacre for that, the fuller report. And also, the, the cause of the, they didn't mention the cause of the conflict happening by the criminal. So they now pointing out the only for the border issue. Hmm. That's really um, very different with the real situation. That's, I pointed out that issue. Okay. Should we, it's uh, five past nine, we're supposed to go until 10. Um, I would like to open the floor to open to questions from the floor, I should say. Can I uh, acknowledge, by the way, that we have a lot of people here from Burma? Have a little corner over here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of people from all kinds of places, I'm sure, in the rest of the room. Can I get an idea of how many people want to ask questions at this point? Not too many. Thank you. Uh, should we take a couple? Of, should we take three questions? It, can I ask you to go to the mic at the back of the room so that we can hear you? Go ahead and ask a question. This gentleman here, he can ask after you. Should we take three three questions? Sure. And then and then put them to everyone. Uh, Peter Jansen, DPA. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry, and Mr. I can't. Sorry, our Mio friend. Win. Uh, can you maybe? Talk a little bit about the upcoming election in 2015 and how you think this Muslim uh, issue is, is playing because obviously Aung San Suu Kyi has been very silent about the whole issue. I think you said thunderously silent, Zarni. Or, uh, you know, how is, is this going to escalate because you've got an election looming uh, two years from now? Is it going to turn into a bigger issue or is it going to become a less issue as the election comes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted out, pointed out some few things. It, even though the 2015 election is coming, if the spread in the country why this racist movement are very, um, how can I say, uh, you know, spreading day by day, 
and very winning their situation over um, you know overwhelm the whole country so we are afraid for the coming 2015 election will be camp of so many racist member of parliament member is very dangerous like a kkk in america in during the period of the civil war civil war, civil rights movement and civil war period so we are really afraid because of they have uh, so much protection you know for minority especially for muslims because the recently the election committee issue different announcement for rohingya issue so we minorities are very afraid even those the whatever whoever took the power as a president the the racism is spread in country wise that's people are fear for the minority the situation is going up like a you know like an autopilot to the country wide to be a racist movement that's really important without educating the people through you know education and civil society or whatever the so called moral leadership educating the people the situation is worse and worse day by day so we also no hope for 2015 election to get a justice and peace and different things this is the fear from the minority i i just want to mention actually that mio win is involved in that he he started a campaign yes. of uh, uh counter stickers exactly. to the 969 stickers yes. uh to say uh, what it is no no barriers or what, what no no religion i can't remember uh, really we call that like um lumio bada mkhoe jam ne manange na for should be translated for kozani i think uh how can i translate it into bamis and also another thing is harmony non-discrimination peace in harmony that's yeah. that's really that we did no, di- no non-discrimination we exactly. are one exactly. something like that yeah. yeah okay um question um michael macky just freelance um sorry i'm on autopilot um just two quick questions is the census that is coming up in burma likely to either inflame this situation or could it calm it down by proving where the majority lies and i'm also wondering about some of the historical actually i'll come back to that one later i'm sure other people have got questions thank you okay does anyone else want to ask a question before i put it to zani and mio win please Yeah, Michael Craven, Thomas Hunt University. Um, the themes you've identified here are racism, uh, religious intolerance, um, uh, xenophobia, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a parallel to what's happening in Sudan in terms of like a, a rush for resources uh, before development really takes over. And, uh, you know, I guess what influence uh, uh, does, I hate to say China, but China have to play in and uh, uh uh you know creating the demand for whatever resources are available there thank you um on the on the census i think you know in in most cases um census taking uh is very politically laden it census itself becomes a strategic you know uh calculated act on the part of the uh the state you know statistics are always about control of population by the by the uh, central and local administration in the case of the rohingyas i think it's already creating like a um, you know a major headache for the authorities just you know about i don't know 10 days ago there was news report uh, you know coming out of arakan uh, rakhain state that rohingya children you know who are supposed to you know know themselves as bengali children they were shouting you know rohingya repeatedly this went viral on the uh, because you know uh, the, the for a community that has taken you know all kinds of like a genocidal measures over the past 40 years you know lying down or running across the border you've got a, a extremely unlikely candidate a group of like your children shouting their own name in the presence of 
the Nasaka and other border affairs official. You know, this is actually significant. Maybe they were, you know, instructed or charmed or given candies to say that you are supposed to say Rohingya. But nonetheless, you know, the, the, the different age groups were involved in this act of basically symbolic and, and to a degree material um, uh, resistance. You know, so, you know the, and on the, I think, um, the census was to basically reinforce the 1982 citizenship, citizenship act. You know, in, in the 1947-48 original constitution of Burma, huh, that was drafted when Aung San was alive and under his leadership and completed after he was assassinated, uh, uh, you know, stipulates that anyone who had been in Burma before 1942 was automatic citizen. Because 1942, because that was the year the British closed their banks and ran to India. The Japanese were coming in. So, so the, the British made sure uh, in, 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 in their like, talks with Aung San and others that the people who had migrated to Burma, you know, if Rohingyas were, in fact, you know, migratory people who came across the border, after Suez Canal was opened in 1868, the official rhetoric from the government as far as the migration and citizenship is that, you know, in 1868, Suez Canal was opened and Rakhine's uh, agricultural economy as well as the Delta region were developed into the world-class uh, rice cash crop economy by the British. Even if their own official narrative were to be taken at face value, by 1942, these migratory people from, say, like East Bengal at the time, would have lived in the country for three generations, close to 75 years. Mm -hmm. So that's not good enough for the racist and the, the uh, neo-fascist in the government. Um, they needed to move the bar even higher. So like they rewrote the constitution uh, but they, a number of times then, Finally, the last constitution they wrote uh, in 1974, and then, you know, they had, after they wrote the 1973 constitution that came into effect in 1974, they attempted extremely harsh measure called Nagamin operation. Naga, in, in astrologically in Burmese, is you know people from uh, in the India and the uh, people from Europe, the, the white people, and then you know the black people. The, uh, the black claw and the white claw. So the, the, by naming this operation, Nagamin, conqueror of the claws, that is the name of the operation. That was, in, that was launched in 1978. Why 1978? Well, Bangladesh just emerged after a genocide by West Pakistan in 1976. Bangladesh was weak, armed forces were broken, the borders were unmanned. So the, uh, the, the, the Nguyen regime launches massive operation with only 200 immigration officials, religious affairs officials, that succeeded in driving out, by its own official statistics, 180,000 Bengali across the border. And so the beef was that. When the Bangladesh, the Indonesian got involved as a, out of Muslim solidarity, other Muslim uh, countries cry foul. Nguyen backed down and took the, uh, uh, you know, so-called Bengali, Rohingyas from Burma back. And so they said, well, 30,000 more came. Yeah. They, they, um, you know, only 160,000 fled the country. When they came back, it was close to 190,000. Yeah, even by their own statistics, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, it, it's only a, fra um, a small percentage of the people who came back, you know, to Burma. Um, can I ask uh, Mio Win and Ajahn Sulak to address this issue about the natural resources, whether there is a correlation between the sort of global race for natural resources uh, and these kind of uh, uh, conflicts of heightened uh, racism, nationalism? Um, yes, this is very controversial. 
If because you don't want to, if you don't want to, address, you know what I mean. Just yeah. Feel yeah. that you can this say is a, this is a, <laughs> say what you need to say. This is a very controversial <laughs> because you know uh, the issue is coming. You know the some problem with the ethnic minorities and armies and governments. They have conflict each other during that period. Rakhine issue is coming based on this criminal. So people thought that. Some people want to be diverse for the situation, like in Rakai or different natural resources for gas production and different things. So again, they don't want to lose again like Miso uh, Dam. So they don't. They wanted to diverse for against the Muslim issue. That's uh, some people are, you know, arguing this issue, and also the same like uh, Labour Down Down issue is coming up. So the situation is faced to the current administration with the public. So again, the divorce to the Maitila issue is coming up. To divorce to attack to Muslims or people are, the, you know, the, the racist movement is going to the, you know, Muslim it's again. It's like a, a diversionary tactic exactly. to draw attention away from yeah. uh, the gas pipeline projects and copper projects. Exactly. Mine projects, mine this projects. is some people thought like that. Some people thought like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I chime in? Just quickly, a chance to like, do you think? Because you talk about commercialism. Um, I think the issue is not just simply, you know, resource grab, you resource scramble in Burma, you know, among different international players, that, you know, in partnership with the Burmese, essentially a, a military, con um, a military through the uh, conglomerates. Uh, in the country. There's also a horizontal issue of uh, resource competition between the Rakhines and the, uh, um, uh, the Rohingyas. In this report, it was very clearly identified um, that, they, that well, the Rohingyas were portrayed as thrifty, hardworking, high productivity community, you know, against whom, you know, non thrifty. Uh, mo uh, choosy work-wise uh, Rakhines. So there's like, you know, some kind of racist, internally racist, orientalist discourse going on. The, 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 you know, the, the, the Rakhines are losing their land uh, because they were not as hardworking and thrifty as the Rohingya. Like in, in a few places, 80% um, of the land, agricultural land, has fallen fallen into the hands of the Rohingyas yeah? uh, because uh, the Rakhines could not compete. Also, the Rohingyas have contacts in Malaysia, other places, so they've got greater capital. And so, you know, like uh, the Rakhine, of the 14 states and uh, uh, divisions in the country, Rakhine is the second poorest country. So this isn't about, you know, which God you're, <laughs> they are worshipping and which God you are worshipping. There is an issue of bread and butter. There is a, you know, a very clear economic dimension. And the, the state, um, the, you know, like uh, Komyowin said, um, finds it in its interest to mobilize the horizontal prejudices. See, that my, my main argument is that it's not that Rohingyas are angelic people or the Rakhines are evil. But, you know, there are, in quotes, natural prejudices, you know, between communities that consider one another the, uh, the cultural other. Anyway, anywhere in the world, you know, Eastern Europe, the same thing, you know, England, the same thing, the very England, you know, liberal England, the same thing. You know, Bulgarians are taking our jobs and the Poles are taking over our churches and running shops. But anyway, the, the horizontal racism is, has been successfully and effectively mobilized by the state, waves by waves. So that is actually the crux of the matter. Um, more questions, please. And I also wonder if we might ask our... Um, I think we have people in the audience from Sri Lanka who might want to talk about their experience. Wow. All right, questions? How, uh, John LaFayette from the Establishment Post. How high do you um, place the chances of another wave of genocide in, in uh, Myanmar? And what do you see as being the end game if that starts? In 1994 in Rwanda, 
The genocide was only stopped when Paul Kagame marched into Kigali. What will be the end game that would stop it in Myanmar? How high do you rate the chances of another wave of violence? And what's the end game that would stop the violence, is the question. Uh, uh, did, uh, did you, let's just take yeah. another question, because I know that gentleman there has been waiting. <laughs> Larry Jagan, uh, freelance journalist. Um, Zani, you've been very um, eloquent and verbose on the issue of the Rohingyas. In the nicest possible way. In the right. nicest possible way. So, uh, I just wondered, what is the connection between what's obviously going on in, in Arakan and what has happened elsewhere, in, particularly in central Burma, uh, uh, against the Muslims? Is there a connection? Uh, is, there a, is there a sort of government grand plan of, of genocide? Um, and, and secondly, I, I'm still curious about what the role of the state, what the role of the authorities has been. In, in Arakan, it's quite clear because of Nasaka. I mean, there's no doubt that, that it has authority uh, and it exercises it. But in Metila, for instance, um, it seemed that the police stood by and didn't do anything, not necessarily because they were given instructions, but in fact the very reverse. They hadn't been given instructions and they didn't know what to do. Is it a case that the police uh, just don't know what the role of community <coughs> policing is all about and, and they stood back? Or, or is there something more sinister uh, behi behind what has been happening uh, in, in central Burma? Thanks a lot, Larry. And the last question. <clears throat> Thank you very much. This is Mong Chonu. I'm the president of Bambis Rohingya Association and also former political prisoner of consciousness. Uh, first of all, I would like to give my tribute to the Achan Sulak and also, you know, thanks to all the, you know, the uh, panel speakers and the audience because you are talking about the Rohingyas, the uh, plights of the Rohingyas. Uh, just uh, this is the time, uh, the question hour, but I would like to highlight a bit on only one question. Last night I didn't see it because when I got the news from the Choctaw that there is the third or fourth, uh, you know, the times of the violence is going, I mean genocide is going in Choctaw, it means they plant. Sorry, sir, it's quite hard okay. to understand you. Can you move your mouth a little bit further put from the microphone? Just, a bit yeah, further? okay, that's better, yes. Go ahead. <coughs> yes, it's not working. You just, just turn it off. Did he? Okay, thanks for your suggestion. Okay, this is my question also that I cannot highlight. But the outcome is a very dire situation now. We don't know that uh, today or tomorrow or tonight there will be another, you know, the, which you call the massacre or genocide there. As well as uh, the whole the Muslims, especially the Tanandari area, Virat, who was now near the, in the border, near the Mesot. Uh, he is uh, talking, he, he used to talk with the DK, uh, DK DKBA, or the, uh, yeah, the Democratic uh, Karen uh, Buddhist uh, Army. So he is going to form Buddhist Army. So I'm very, we are very tense. Uh, we don't know that uh, we can be, you know, allowed. Uh, the, the, the Muslim will be in Myanmar in further or not, I don't know, because they would like to start the new style of genocide again. Thanks. So my question is that, I don't know what is okay. The, now is the genocide. What is that? Mike is not working. Okay. okay, this is the genocide. Al Jazeera documented that this was hidden genocide by uh, P. Rees the last uh, couple months ago. Now, Dr. John is said a genocide. I myself, I'm a Rohingya. We know that this is the genocide. So for the genocide, now nearly one year, genocide against the Rohingyas, that then it's shifted to the Propa Burma, Central Burma, Mithila, and the you know, Mandela Division, and the Pogo Division, as well as the Yangon. You know the news, most of the you know, audience and the, world, the, the people uh, are aware of that. One place, a student under, the, under 18, Nearly 13 or 14 students were abandoned in Yangon, near the Yangon. This is the former capital city of Myanmar. In middle of the same. In the other area, maybe Kumyo Wing know about that. Hmm. So this genocide. Now, the, my question is, 
we are not, we are main Rohingyas, Muslim of Myanmar, Kashin included some ethnic minorities. Then the, the same Ajahn Sulak also told that, the, you know, the some Christian minority. We are not protected nationally. It means peasant government, Uten Singh plus Dawson Suji government. If we are not attack, protected by our own government, do we have do we have any chance or any rights to get protection internationally? We asked many times international protection for one year. Up to now, we learned that we are not getting any good or any you know, signal or any practical reply from the international community, including United Nations, UNFC, United, you know, the, and also ASEAN. So this time, this is the genocide I am again say, saying. Okay. Do we have, do the Rohingyas and Muslim of Myanmar have any rights? We deserve to protect ourselves like Kashin protects themselves, Karen protects themselves. Do we have, do we have any right to get protection to our own people? Could you please find out any law or any 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 norms of law or any facts from uh, through the international you know the uh, uh, okay. law to okay. get protects to to, deserve, to defend ourselves thank you very much thank you very much sir okay uh should start with the questions from the first gentleman about um the likelihood of another wave of violence and what the end game could be um i'd like to hear your input <clears throat> this is very difficult to say, but the seem to be they're still keeping this hatred and you know racist movement going on. That I can say like that. So the minorities are fear and fear day by day. So they have feeling they have no protection protection for them. So I can say like that. Uh, when you say the minorities, you you mean. Uh, especially Muslims? the for Muslim, but according to the scenario of the current situation and the current crisis attack against the Muslim, but other minority also thinking for them. How about after the Muslim? The movement may come to them. Mm. That's uh, still yeah. chatting each other like uh, other minorities, especially for non-Buddhist people. They have a fear. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to add on? Um, Tony, um, can, and yes. also with the end game, can you imagine well, the how, end, I how think, it could end? Yeah. I think if you look at, you know, the uh, patterns of uh, genocides that have happened over the past, say, 100 years, yeah? Genocides are best understood not as events, as processes that unfold, you know, uh, phase by phase. Yeah? And starts with the language, you know, like the viruses, you know, the, the leeches, the bloodsuckers, these like, you know, construction of an uh, ethno-religious community as, as Ajahn said, um, half human beings, <laughs> you know, the, the way... You're not killing human beings, you're killing leeches and viruses. You're not shooting them, yeah? How many of us can conceivably say that, you know, we would kill a six-year-old girl or a boy, you know, in cold blood, yeah? But it's possible that we may kick a dog or even like, you know, halal or chicken for our food, but killing a group of children and throwing them onto the burning fire. But that's done. That's done. When that group of children are constructed in our mind's eyes as leeches and viruses and half-humans. Yeah? It's a mental, it starts with mental construction. That's why you know, names are very important. People debate about Burma and Myanmar. We should be debating about Rohingya and Bengali. Because there is an act of ethnocide there, more consequential than we call Burma, Burma or Myanmar. Yeah? And secondly, um, I think the state is always, 
always involved in any type of mass violence by the very fact that the state is the only institution that is most well organized and morally sanctioned in the eyes of its citizens to dish out any violent acts. That's Mark's favor. <laughs> you know, it's uh, the political science, <laughs> not even 101. Everybody knows the state, the police, the army, the militia are morally sanctioned to do anything it pleases in the name of national security. What we are seeing is the interface between the defense of the faith, the Buddhist faith, and the defense of the nation and national security. Yeah? When you have that kind of discourse, the state involvement, I'm not talking about tacit backing or looking the other way, but direct involvement. And Larry asked a question, which is, yes. which is the question that keeps coming up, and which actually, uh, uh, I find it rather, um, um, well, let me just phrase it. The Australians and others have been saying, well, this is like, you know, even actually of all the people, Suchi, Don San Suchi, have said, well, you know, we're in a democratic transition, so the police are confused about how to, like, you know, use their lethal power, whether to shoot or to fire into the air. Well, you know, the Metila incident, the police were negotiating, you know, very credible evidence would suggest, the police negotiated how much time that these like, mob, organized mob would have to destroy a monastery. In one place, you have half hour, and they were smoking and you know, uh, chit-chatting with others. You know, everybody knew from Burma. And um, I think if you look at the very, very quick and disproportionate use of force against Buddhist monks, at 2.30 in the morning, while the monks were sleeping, there were fire engine, you know, spraying water on the protest camps outside the head, uh, head regional quarters of the Chinese mine company that is in joint venture with the Burmese conglomerate. So the thing, I mean, I think of like two different scenarios. In one scenario, the Burmese army, the commanders, were, you know, so same too tactics. happy same tactics. to use... Yeah white frost brush canisters to kill, you know, to frighten the monks, to drive fear in their bones, and, you know, while in the case of, like, you know, um, in the case where the protection of the Muslims in Maitila were called for, right. okay. they sat on their hands. And finally, I think, Larry, it's difficult for ordinary citizens like yourself, myself, because we are human beings. We think like and as human beings, but the states are superhuman institutions. In 1960s, early 60s, John F. Kennedy administration would hold that brainstorming sessions how to handle Fidel Castro. In one of the sessions, according to Arthur Schlesinger Jr., you know, like a, one of Kennedy's advisors, the Americans in the White House at the National Security Council entertain, entertain, or table an idea that they would sink the U.S. naval ship in the, in the uh, Cuban waters and, and use it as a pretext to bomb Castro out of power. And so, like, you know, that's a, How many of us would think that, you know, we will maintain our privileges and power and wealth at the expense of 100,000 lives, but the states are capable of thinking that way? Um, to answer the second part of your question, um, Ben, about the end game, do you, do, do you want to offer an end game, or are we seriously looking at the inevitable extinction of Rohingya people? Um, I, I think that the end game for Pol Pot regime was when Vietnamese tanks, you know, ran into the streets of, onto the streets of Phnom Penh. The end game of the Bengali, Bangladeshi, East Bengali massacre was when the Indians, the, you know, leadership of India Gandhi mobilized the entire might of the Indian armed forces, including Air Force and Navy, to stop the uh, Pakistani um, genocide. So in, in the case of the Rohingyas, you know, I mean, all I see that represents, say, like 57 different or 56, 57 different countries around the world. It's internally fractured. 
Yeah? And uh, uh, the, the, uh, or the, you know, the, even within this, con- uh, within this region, Indonesia, of all the places, you know, the largest, the most populous Muslim nation on earth, <laughs> right, right around the street, was, it has been investing 200 million in cement factory, another, you know, like a dozen, couple dozen millions in the other coal mining, yeah? But, uh, I resigned from Brunei, you know, uh, um, about a week after Thane Sein came, because the entire university security department was assigned to make sure that I don't get anywhere near Thane Sein. I was, I was, I, I, I had a professorship there. And then, you know, the, it was, the, when Thane Sein and his entourage came, 57 of them, you know, the, the sultan was all smile. You know, on the front page of, you know, both newspapers run by the state in, so it, in Brunei, yeah. it was all about oil and gas, not yes. about Rohingya. Mm-hmm. All right. So the way that things stand, yes, that is what we're looking at. Yeah, it at. will go gradually. And, and, and the, you know, the Burmese regime is actually very, very smart. They don't resolve conflicts. They manage conflicts in the way that suits, that advances their strategic goals. You know, that's, a, you know, like we need an entirely different type of regime that wants to resolve conflicts humanely, peacefully, and to the benefit of the citizen. But this regime is there, you know. But this is the, a completely different narrative from the, what you read in the in the newspapers, in the major world newspapers Well, yeah, of course, nowadays. I mean, the dip- diplomats in Rangoon would react strongly, I've heard, to the, to the characterization of the mass violence against Muslims and Rohingya, especially Rohingyas, as ethnic cleansing, yeah? And then, so, like, because I they don't want to be seen holding hands with genocidists, <laughs> so they cannot afford to call the Thane Sein and his regimes genocidists. They have to... Praise him. They have to shower him with praises and award, as our ICG has done. Mm. <laughs> Did you want to chip in on that? Because, I mean, we do have ostensibly a new Burma. There have been dramatic changes in the country. This, what we've been talking about, is a completely different narrative. How can they coexist? I think that's very easy to... If current authority, if they want to stop this kind of violence. Well, we start tomorrow. If they start today, they can stop today. I think. Because of they have a rich experience of for how to stop this kind of activities. But I'm not... But I have... How can I say... But they're not. They are yeah, not. They are not. They are not. Right. Yeah, that's, they, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the connection between yes. Métis Law and Rakhine, that was raised, yeah? Exactly. And that connection is anti, basically Islamophobia, yeah? And then uh, think about it, with it, uh, I mean, you think of this issue demographically. Yeah. For, uh, in Rakhine State, there are 3.3 million population in total, and 29% of Rohingya, they are confined to a tiny strip of land in northern Rakhine State, and they're, they, the, think about this, we only think of genocide as bloodshed. The Rohingyas in Budida, Mondo, and that, those two districts yeah, have a doctor-patient ratio of one is to, guess, 700,000. In Sitwe, and, you know, in Sitwe, not, you know, not that distant, the capital of Rakhine State, the doctor-patient ratio is one is to six hundred and seventy, yeah. And there, are, the northern Rakhine state is basically a garrison region. There are secu- there are nine security grids, yeah. That was guard- that are guarded by monitored twenty four seven by the um, Nasaka. And and so this is the case where oppression is money. For the security. If you want to go and farm at the different village or go work in a fishery across town, you pay Nasaka because your movement means money for your restriction on your movement translate into cash. And we call it corruption. Yeah? And then so marriages are banned 
population control is like pursued actively, mm. and um, the you know the there are sixty thousand unregistered children. What that means is these sixty thousand unregistered children have no schooling, no clinic. I mean, grown ups even have like you know. They they only have one doctor for six hundred uh, sorry like sixty or seventy thousand people. Forget sixty thousand children. And so, making the life of these people hell on earth, living hell on earth, is part of this gradual structural genocide that is actually different from mass killing. It's just so grim. This scenario that's being point. I mean, I'm. Uh, is there, are there any more questions? Yeah. Sorry, it was, it's actually two. Um, is one way forward to bring in the IOC, the Islamic Organization Conference, to bring the issue to an international dimension? And I think it's been raised but not really um, elaborated on. Is what we are seeing one of the nasty symptoms of a society in acute flux that wherever a closed... Well... You're nodding, but, you know, wherever we have had closed societies that have had to open, Eastern Europe is a particularly good example. Nasty symptoms have come out. Explain to me, please, why this one is so different, why this is not a symptom of transition. Um. I'm sorry, um, I, I seem to be dominating the panel. I'm no. very uh, apologized. Okay. Um, you know, genocide or mass violence, mass political violence, if you don't like the word ethnic cleansing, if you don't like the word, whatever word you want to use it, the actual fact is that there is an organized violence on a large scale, you know, like 12 towns, coordinated attacks in different periods. That's mass violence. Mass violence is not necessarily and naturally an outcome of any political transition. Yeah? We have, you know, if you look at you know, the history of mass violence, we have more cases of societies, closed societies, opening up without any mass violence than we have cases where you know, pre-genocidal, genocidal um, you know, violence flares up. So this is the, I, th I would say, I think like some of you are honest, but, you know, the organizations such as the International Crisis Group that wants to turn conflict zones into free markets, that's their mandate. That's where they get like, you know, that's why they get like 60% of their funding from the neoliberal governments around the world. Their argument is that it is the greater freedoms that the Burmese are enjoying, yeah, uh, that have resulted in this. This is so disingenuous. If you look at you know, co um, the, the breakup of Yugoslavia, there was a very, very clear involvement of the state. And in our case, so this is the state that, you know, actually the country has had a long tradition of political violence involving state political parties as well as state security organizations. No one other than the presidential advisor, Choi Yin Line, wrote in 2007 before he you know, was able to approach and got anywhere near the regime. In the Fletcher Forum's affair, or current affairs, the Burmese military intelligence around 2006 and Mandalay 2005 were involved in attempting to instigate violence against Muslims in Mandalay area, fabricating the story of the rape, the rape of a Burmese woman by a group of Muslim men. A similar trigger, a similar story was used uh, in, the, uh, in the Rakhine state. And so I, I would categorically reject that this is primarily about Burmese learning to enjoy freedoms and ended, ended up behaving badly. No, no, there is a very clear evidence of the regime's involvement. That is precisely Human Rights Watch, the main, main uh, uh, one of Human Rights Watch's main uh, points. And Quintana has said it, 
Nambia has said it, there, there is a clear and direct involvement of state institutions. State institutions take orders from, the, from Nepi Do, no one else. Okay, we have about um, 10 minutes left and I can sense some loss of attention over at the bar. Should, should I? <laughs> should, Hello, should, yes, I'm watching you. Should I, <laughs> we should, do have, should I say something? Would you, yes, I would like you to say something. You keep saying no. Uh, I sympathize with our Burmese friend. When you look at your country, it looks much worse than other countries. Now, if you compare Burma with China, I think the Chinese suffer much more than in Burma because of dictatorial regime. Not to mention the Tibetans and the other small ethnic groups. They suffer much more than in Burma. Now, look at this country. It may look better than Burma, but grass on the other side of the fence is much greener. In this country, we treated the Muslim pretty badly for over 200 years in the South. And nobody, mainstream Siamese care, that's why don't, they don't even care for the word Thailand, which in, is an oppressive word, because the Malay in the south have the right to call themselves Malay Muslim, and we call them Thai Muslim, but they are not Thai Muslim. Perhaps they were not treated as badly as in Burma, but they have, not been, have been treated very, very badly from their point of view. So I feel that one has to look things into perspective. I don't want to say that things are that rosy in Burma. But I want to give you some of uh, a friendly caution that one must look positively for the future. Of course, the army is still the power that be behind the scene. The president is a, a tool of the army. And so is Indonesia. And so is this country. But one good thing about Burma, if I may say so, those of you who have been detained since 888, have suffered more than the Thai been treated very badly 6th of October. And I think if you learn from your own suffering, comparing with Rohingya, you are much lighter. But in that case, in which way can you share suffering with those people? It's you the young people who have been suffered will change. Not the military, not the president, not even Lady Aung San Suu Kyi. But at the same time, don't regard her as the enemy. Regard her with sympathy. Regard her as something to be careful. I feel any country, a small group of people come together. And if I may say so, my very limited experience in Burma and my collaboration with the Burmese for the last 15 years, I have much hope in you people. Thing ahead is not going to be easy. You are jumping from the Chinese Empire to the American Empire. You are jumping from the devil from the deep blue sea. And the American Empire may be worse than the Chinese Empire. Because now they are coming with money, 
and they're nice to you, they invite you to go to Princeton and all that. Not to deny the invitation, but you must put your priority right. What you need to do, and I think, from what I know, these young people, I think you have guts, you have moral courage, and much more than the Thai, you have deep conviction. Because we have been brainwashed by the American for over 50 years, since 1947, worse than that, since 1957. All our leaders have been brainwashed by American education. Be careful. You may do likewise. But I think if you are true to yourself, put your priority right. Those of you who are Buddhist, care for the Muslim. If you are Burman, care for the Rohingya as much as you care for the Mon, for the Kachin, the Karen. We have not mentioned about the Christian. They also suffer so much. The Kachin cease fire, yet they have been killed all the time. I don't look for the top people. I don't look for the big people. I look to all you people. You are here tonight. And you are not here tonight. I think the future is in your hand. You must learn Satyagraha. To be truthful, to be self reliance to be non-violence. I think that's the answer for you and for all those minorities. I hope you take my message seriously. Don't regard me as an old man preaching at the end of his life. Thank you for your attention. So po kwa. So po kwa. Actually, ko, this young man, uh, actually, back to the back. Yeah, he's uh, squashed there because they're, they're hemming him in. Because apparently, he is one of Myanmar, Burma's most well regarded singers. He happens to be here tonight. Very Does famous man. Anyone guitar with you? Yeah, I, I asked that. Anyone got a guitar? You know. See, if this was the Philippines, there'd be a guitar in the room. <laughs> Most famous reggae. Reggae. Reggae, right? Uh, my, I, my understanding is reggae, right? He sings Pete Tosh and Bob Marley covers. Um, if I may rather unconventionally for the... Uh, esteemed and distinguished FCCT, end the evening on a note, a musical note, uh, and a thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and for participating in this discussion, and a special thanks to uh, Mio Win, who's come all the way from Burma, uh, to Ajahn Sulak, and also to Dr. Zani. Do you want to take it, So Fo Kwa? Yeah. What are you no. going to sing? What are you going to sing? With Clark. Which one? Like it, yeah. If you don't mind, please. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of my people, love is the answer I found tonight. Yeah, man. What we need that is love. Yeah. What we need that is love. Yeah. What we need that is love. Hey, love. Yes, is this love. Yeah. What we need that is love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What we need that is love. What we need that is love. Hey, love. Love is the answer. Yeah. Yeah, there is no fighting, yeah. There's no more crying. See my man. There's no more trouble. You got it. There's no more problem, yeah. There's me no more war. 
Hey, wow, never the never. What you say? What we need that uh, this love, yeah. <laughs> what we need that uh, this love, yeah. Come on. What we need that uh, this love, hey, love, love is the answer. What you say? Love is the answer. Come on, man. Oh, love is the answer. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thanks very much. Have a good evening, everyone.